Howdy, shouty girl. It's good to see you again. Um, as you can see, I'm reporting from the shopping cart here today. Um, and a couple weeks ago, I put out my first ever YouTube video about urbanism. Nobody likes this. Everybody hates this. Expecting nothing to come from it. I fully made that because my friends and family have gotten so pissed off with the fact that I can't shut up about this. Um, but people seem to have really liked it. I mean, I got a ton, more, you know, more feedback than I ever could have dreamed I would have gotten, which is amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of it was, was suggestions and feedback and constructive criticisms. So uh, I figured I would make this as sort of a, an update video in between the part one that came out and part two, which I'm working on right now. So this is not part two to that video. That will be coming out shortly. But uh, yeah, let's get down to it. Respond to some comments. The first category of comments is a really specific criticism from the video, which I want to address. I put a pinned comment on the original video about it as well, but um, I got something wrong. I said that in places where people don't drive cars, that uh, family and friends don't check in with one another, like the whole take you know, text me when you get home safe type of thing. Um, that's not true, obviously. Um, and I, I could have stated my point so much more clearly. So the counter argument there is that in places where people don't drive cars, where they walk or take public transportation, that crime happens and things can go wrong on your way home um, other than, you know, car related tragedies. So violent crime is an externality caused by many, many different factors. And I would argue that in the vast majority of places, your danger of getting hurt or killed as a result of a car, whether you're the driver or a pedestrian, is much, much greater than your likelihood of getting, uh, you know, being the victim of a violent crime. It's not true for all places, but for the vast majority of places, I think that's the case. But the point in general that I was trying to make even beyond that was that when it comes to the danger of getting home safely in a car, the danger is designed into the, the fundamentals of the system of mobility, right? We do have places where, you know, it's a 65 mile an hour design speed on a road with a traffic light, you know, with another 65 mile an hour road going the other direction. That is a design choice. That inevitably leads to tragedy. When it comes to dealing with violent crime, it's a complex problem. There's many, many different ways of addressing it. When it comes to uh, getting home safely in a vehicle, we design things the wrong way, straight up. Like we design things in a way where car accidents will inevitably occur. So that's the point that I was trying to make. Um, and I did a terrible job of making that point. I did not say the thing that I meant. And the thing that I said was false. People do check in with their family and friends uh, if they don't drive a car. So that's my bad, I'm sorry. There were also a bunch of people who asked about the lady that came up and harassed me and forced me to stop filming um, when I was filming in downtown Asheville near the expressway. And lots of people were also like, you know, why didn't you just say no? Like, why didn't you just tell her to buzz off? So it's really hard to keep filming a video, especially one that's dependent on audio when someone's like actively yelling at you and disturbing you. And the thing is, it wasn't a situation where it was like, I could just tell her to stop because she was like incoherent and clearly like going through it. And I felt bad for her. I didn't want to fight her on it or, or uh, you know, escalate the situation anymore. So I figured it was best to just, you know, go film it later. And it was fine. I'm not angry with her. She wasn't even really a Karen. She was more just like someone who was unfortunately having a very bad time. Some of the comments were really funny. I really liked this comment by Donkeyfly43 that said, Bob Rob Strode Blob Blog. Bob Rob Strode Blob. Bob, <laughs> Bob Rob's Strode Blob Blog. To me, this is giving um, 50 black slick back hair wigs. Tiny Dinky Daffy, pancaked by drunk dump truck driver. If you know, you know. Robustus2129 said, Americans would drive to the bathroom if they could. I mean, I don't think it's Americans' fault that they have to drive because they didn't make those decisions, but you're right. Uh, lots of Americans would love to drive to the bathroom. I also liked this comment from Yogi Pony 9016 It says, force bikes into car places. You can be a hero and live a short life. You know what, all of the, all of the bicyclists and pedestrians who, you know, take the space as they say, it's a very brave thing to do. I'm too scared to do that, to be honest. So thank you for being brave and potentially living a short life. That's a good thing to do. 
there's a FedEx truck coming and, and clearly looking at the fact that I'm sitting in a shopping cart. That's that on that. Flurix9967 said, I'm based out of Bryson City and would love if you could point out how Strodes have affected even small towns and that this isn't just a city problem. That's absolutely true. I mean, I think the bigger the city, generally speaking, the better the chance of recovery from car dependency. It's the small towns that got, you know, interstate highway bypasses connected to terrible Strodes that drained the life out of the downtowns. Um, some of the worst roads in the country, I think, are in some of the smallest towns. So I would love to do more content about that. It's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Gandalf47 suggested that I go find the original plans and the documentation about the hearings and planning board meetings that led to Patton Avenue getting so bad so that I could speak directly to the justifications for how it got that way. It's a great idea. The issue with Patton Avenue is that uh, that information is basically lost. The road was originally plotted out uh, in the 50s, in 1952, I think, and then later expanded at some point between the 60s and 70s based on the aerial imagery that I've looked at. Um, but I couldn't find any information about the expansion of Patton Avenue specifically. But it's a very good idea for um, new strodes that are getting built. I'm going to be doing a lot of what you suggested in the next video. No new strodes! Some people wanted to know about the music that I used in the video. Um, m most of it was uh, like 70s mall Muzak. I figured it just conveyed the vibe of like atrocious consumerism pretty well. It felt like it tonally matched what it feels like to exist on a strode. So that's why I chose it. But I'll link it in the description. I can't remember the specific title of the video off the top of my head, but it's available to you there underneath the video. Some commenters had some really excellent points and additions to the video. Um, here were some of my favorites. Tormekia, Tormekia, something like that, says, It sucks for those of us who can't drive. We're stuck with this. Um, and don't even get me started on the areas without sidewalks. Hey, disabled people, hurry up and splat, okay? This is very, this is so true. This is true for people who have disabilities. This is true also for elderly people. You hear a lot of complaints about people being too old to drive. And, you know, like, Basically, what we're saying to old people is you can't drive, so you don't get to participate in society anymore. You aged out of being able to do anything. It's just like really sad and kind of morbid. I think a lot of elderly people would have so much more independence and ability to live on their own if it weren't for the fact that they were trapped by car dependency. Um, not everyone can drive. And for people who can't drive, what we have is like pitifully under equipped for you know, them being able to move around or get around. And even when we have bicycle infrastructure, um, that's not good for people who can't bike either. Like we need to design these places to be usable for everyone. It reminds me of Mobility Mary using the bike lanes with her mobility scooter. Oh my God. Excuse, Excuse me, sir. You almost hit me. You, you made, made a totally illegal, illegal move. move. I love Mobility Mary to death. Yes, I'm serious. Just, like truly, like, truly, like, it's some of my favorite content on the internet. Me. Because on the one hand, like, she is pretty insufferable and is clearly looking for trouble and enjoys confrontation. But I love watching videos of people who intentionally seek out confrontation. I don't know that I can defend the, um, it's, it's a, a leash law, law thing. They bite me, they jump on me, they scratch me. But you know, like, she does end up in a lot of situations where cars could easily kill her uh, because she's in a mobility scooter. It's not right. Get the fuck off the street with that thing. You're in the street. It's not a car. That's not a car. It's I a disability not... mobility. So go away. You should get out the street with that thing that you're riding. And the thing is, most of the time she's right. Oh my God. No one's gonna let me cross. Tony Walters 7298 says, basically, if you're not working or spending money, there are very few places you are welcome to be in in this day and age. This is the third place problem. There's a name for that. Historically, societies have had, you know, third places where anyone is welcome to be. We lack that in a lot of cases in the United States. Parks are third places, but it sucks when you have to drive to that third place because it excludes anyone who can't do that. Definitely would love to make a video about the third place problem. 
Scott Frazier, 4669, said, It's too bad that for close to three decades, starting in 1956, the whole country was politically aligned when it came to highway construction, giving birth to the car-dependent suburbs. Democrats and Republicans nearly unanimously agreed to keep approving highway construction, a kind of political alignment that's unheard of today. It's a very good point. The only way that we were able to complete the transformation of an entire continent for the suburban experiment was through broad political alignment between Democrats and Republicans. It's very unfortunate. They thought that they knew better. They all thought that the utopian vision was going to come true with the car. It's so sad in retrospect. So many people see this as like a divided political issue now, where the socialists want everyone to be forced to ride the train and, you know, the government decides where you can and can't go. And, uh, you know, conservatives are the freedom loving, you know, they, they love the true American way of total freedom through the car. Uh, but the reality is, is that like, in my opinion, you can make a rock solid conservative case against car dependency. The, the creation of Strode's and highways was largely the result of like extreme government intervention and our highways are paid for by the government largely the federal government the gas tax doesn't even come close to covering that so you know I, like honestly in my opinion our poor land use policies and our decisions about transportation spending are largely the result of government overreach lots of people are locked into the transit equals totalitarianism and car equals freedom mindset. The thing is being able to have cars in society and have transit, they're not mutually exclusive. And in my opinion, our independence has been severely limited by the reduction in choices. I mean, we once had cities that were walkable, um, that had good transit, and we traded that to limit people's options only to the car. That's a reduction in freedom in my view. So many people think car is freedom transit is communism <laughs> that doesn't make any sense that's like incoherent in my opinion dan wiley sears 1134 says no new strodes is a reasonable starting point but a no without an instead isn't going to get far i think it's a really solid point um i don't like that my first video was purely describing the problem without offering solutions um but i would say no new strodes is you know the it's how we should begin to solve this problem with regards to fixing what we already have and finding the alternative, that's a really complicated, hard problem that people have been studying for decades. Um, suburban retrofitting is not an easy thing to do. And I'm a 23 year old dude. I don't have the answers to this. Like I don't, I'm trying to learn as much as I can about how we can solve this problem, about how things can get better, about how I can have hope for, you know, the place that I love so much, North Carolina. Um, but it, that's hard to do, um, and it's not totally clear how all of that's going to play out. I would love to make a video about what I think the future of the suburbs is going to be. Um, but, you know, I'll get to that. <laughs> I'll certainly be making more videos about, you know, solutions to this problem in the future. At Macronomicus says, The thing about North Carolina is the roads are not locally controlled. Sometimes there may be local input, but the state has total control over every aspect. That's absolutely true. I mean, the North Carolina DOT basically holds cities hostage by giving them several bad alternatives, all of which are car centric and forcing them to pick between the three. Um, but ultimately the DOT creates all of those designs and they do it according to the manual of uniform traffic control devices and other standards manuals for modern transportation planning. Lots of places do have, you know, local roads and county roads, uh, but my understanding is that in North Carolina we have state-owned routes and we have city streets. So city streets are obviously controlled by whatever municipality they're in, um, but also in cities we have um, state roads. Patton Avenue is a perfect example. And ultimately, the state of North Carolina gets the final say-so about how these things are built. And I want to add, like, these decisions are not made by democratically elected officials. These decisions are made by professionals who consider the speed and volume of cars, and then the safety, and then the cost. Um, but they're not, they're not the people who live there. They're not the people who have the best idea of how it can be the best, you know, habitat for human beings. Again, I think this is too much centralization of power in the state government. But somehow, so many conservatives see that and they're completely fine with it. I mean, they're completely fine with disastrous federal and state government spending on, you know, highway transportation projects because 
I own my car and I don't own the train and car equals freedom and train equals socialism. But like, ultimately, we are at the beck and call of the state government and they're making terrible decisions on our behalf. That doesn't seem like something that conservatives would buy into very easily, but apparently they do. And some of these conspiracy comments were so long. I'm sorry, I don't got time to read all that. Thanks for saying it though, I appreciate you taking the time to write it. Some of the comments were just confusing, and I guess that's to be expected with YouTube comments, but like, beam me up, Scotty. Okay, suddenly I'm in the mood for some crunchy granola and asparagus. What? I mean, the granola makes me think it's like a peace, love, and natural snacks. Like, you, you know, if you're a Democrat, so you like to eat healthy food. Comment? But, like, I'm pretty sure eating asparagus is a normal thing across the aisle. I don't think it matters whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican if you eat asparagus. Stop reproducing, period. Uh, well, I wasn't planning on doing that anyway. I hope you're not one of them eco-zombies who sits on the road protesting oil. If you are, I will have to pour spoiled milk on you. I do enjoy your videos though and do agree that we need more efficient and non-car friendly roads. What is your angle, dog? I don't understand. My camera died and it was getting dark, but I'm once again in the shopping cart coming to you from a new location to get a varied background to the shots in this video. If this shopping cart slips, I'm just gonna have to bail, because I'm directly at the top of a gigantic hill right now. Some commenters had a lot to say about what they thought the the true cause of car dependency is, and I, I don't think that these people are wrong, to be honest, but I think it's interesting to observe the relationship between cause and effect here, because each of these things are both effects and causes of car dependency they reinforce one another in a vicious cycle. And that has a lot to do with how we got here. In the case of cultural attitudes and individualism, I think we were able to live, you know, communally in cities for a very long time in America before car dependency happened. And the attitude that we should all be far apart from one another and, and, and you want to have as little contact with other people as possible, that was definitely reinforced by car dependency. Another one is density. We have car dependency because of a lack of density. That's true, but we also have a lack of density because of car dependency. Hilar, you got Eli. Eli's here. What have you got to say to the folks? Back at home. We are home. They're, I mean, they're also at home. Yeah. Fuck car dependency. That's a, that's a good point, Eli. Thank you. What do you think? Ooh. Poopy. Poopy smell. The fuck? Thank you. A couple of people asked me to stop swearing and like, this is entertainment. This is a YouTube video. This is not the county board of commissioners or the planning board. One person did say that they wanted to show the video to their students, but they couldn't because of all the F-bombs, which I do feel bad about. But also, like, I don't know if I'm the right person to deliver informational content to children. So, sorry about that. A bunch of people in the comments recommended Not Just Bikes to me, which is very sweet. I've seen all of the Not Just Bikes videos. He's fantastic. He's better at this than I am. Go watch him instead of watching me, for real. Tulip Q says, I grew up in a New Jersey exurb and I was this total freak in my circle of friends because I took to biking everywhere for myself. Yeah, you became a cyclist. In the United States, if you ride a bicycle, you're like automatically categorized into the category of cyclist. And boy, do Americans hate cyclists. Mm -mm. You do not want to be labeled a cyclist. People will harass you and put you in danger and uh, treat you like a second-class citizen for being a cyclist. So what I like to do is I like to call people who drive motorists just, to, um, just so that they have their own shitty label too. All right, anyway, that's enough comment responses. Uh, thank you to anyone who actually cared enough to make it to the end of this video. I hope you'll watch part two when it comes out because I think it's going to be better than part one. I'm really excited about it. It's been fun to work on. Um, so, yep, I will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Take care, don't die in a car accident.